Okay, hello everyone. Uh, before I start, uh, Jonathan asked me a favor. It looks like that we forgot a really important crowd. So where are the data scientists? Ah, great, a couple of people. Data engineers? Awesome, that's perfect. Cool, so today I'm going to start with something that, you know, we already have a presentation that it was basically about scaling down. I'm going to scale up again, fuck it. Um, so I'm going to introduce this myself. My name is Juan. Uh, work at Travel Star. Um, first of all, well, it's Juan. It's not Yuan. It's not Juan. Juan. I mean, the easiest way that I found, you know, who Juan, if you want to. <laughs> it's easy to remember. Uh, and the second thing is that I'm from Colombia. You can feel my accent. Uh, Colombia's with O, guys. Uh, with U, it's the United States. I'm not American. I'm Colombian, South America. Really close to Brazil, that we were over here. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I've been working at Travel Star for three years. I'm the data ops team lead. And uh, yeah, I, I used to be a lecturer uh, for, a, for a while. I used to have my company. And now I'm here in South Africa for the last four years. So Travel Star, for the, the ones who don't know what is Travel Star, Travel Star is basically an online travel agency. We basically, as it says over there, we just want to give you like the, you know, making travel simple. Uh, we are, we are, currently we have 850 you know, employees in average all over the place. Uh, we're mostly here in Cape Town, but as you can see, we have uh, offices in Porto, we have offices in Greece, um, South Africa, of course, Taipei. Um, yeah, so all over the place we are right now. So let's start with the real stuff. So this is a really nice quote that is from the um, data head of GCP. Um, and as you can see, 80% of people, they actually use data right, in, in Google to make decisions. Every single time that I mentioned that, people always come and say, yeah, but it's, you know, it's Google, data savvy, they know everything. Well, actually, that's bullshit. Um, you can see in this graph from Alphabet um, that mostly 62% of employees at Google, they're not technical. So what is that 80%? So 80%. It comes from these people that are from operations, that are from marketing. You know, just 30% of, 32% of that, of that, of 38% represents technical people, okay? So that means that everyone should touch data on a daily basis. And this is the quote that motivates us in a travel star to, you know, to move more to a data ops approach. Instead of, you know, of giving you the answer, I should give you the query or a, or a big query view to that stuff. Okay, that's what it motivates us at Travel Star. So how did it start? It started in 2014, basically a really simple BI infrastructure, uh, pool-based, and I think it was never thought to a scale. Because of that, at 2018, shit hit the fan, and you know now we have low performance queries. Some of the queries used to take days. Uh, you know, <laughs> sometimes that you can see. A query that it used to take days when we, we, we improved it, then it was 20 minutes. So yeah, so there was a lot of things over there. And because of all those reasons, we decided in 2018 to move to a data ops approach. And this data ops approach is more oriented to event-driven architectures, uh, best practices of software engineering, and the most important things, removing the bottleneck and do it yourself. That's basically what I'm going to present to you right now. So what is data ops? Before explaining what is data ops and what we're trying to do at Travel Star with data ops, let's understand the data process generations. So there are like three different generations. The first generation is what I call the click-click generation. It's like these huge products that used to come to you, the sales guy, this is going to solve all your problems. You know, like it just costs one million dollars, but it's going to solve all your problems. Um, you know, I saw that in in you know, I guess companies when they actually they bought two of those products. Like, ah, oh, we bought the Oracle product and the Microsoft product. So what the fuck? Uh, how much did it cost? Now, each one costs $1 million. OK. Yeah, and no one is using Like, perfect. Um, the problem with these solutions, they were monolithic solutions that in the end, you ended up with thousands of unmaintainable ETLs. You know, store procedures all over the place, cron jobs all over the place, no orchestration. And just to give you an example, at Travel Star, we used to, well, we still have because we're serving the process migration, but 96 is uh, sort procedure and 64 cron jobs, no orchestration at all. 
So that's, the, you know, that's really easy to fuck that up. Um, actually, <laughs> next week I'm going to have the, you know, the beautiful opportunity to come to the CEO and say, yeah, so after I migrated all the data, we saw that we missed 100,000 bookings for the last eight years. Sorry. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit of that first generation. The second generation is the big data generation. Now, this big, huge big data ecosystem where it was like, you know, data lakes can solve all your problems of your life. And of course, that was a bullshit. Everyone knows that. But, you know, we have this solution, Hadoop. I saw the guy from, you know, the, the creator of Hadoop, like trying to start up in Hadoop on a real life presentation, and he couldn't start it up. He's like, oh, sorry, guys, I wanted to show you a demo, but I couldn't start Hadoop. Well done, you were the creator. Well, so that's the kind of solution. So there was like a lot of data that it was, you know, raw data, bunch of data, and dif difficult to analyze, okay? And the third generation is what is called the event driven, you know, like the event driven generation, near real time stream pipelines. That is a new generation that right now we're moving in Charles Star, but this is not enough. You can create the same problems from the previous generations if, you know, you can still have 10,000 pipelines without any kind of orchestration. Or you can have 10,000 serverless functions without any kind of orchestration. So this last generation needs to, uh, in a certain way, be aligned with something that's called data mesh. That's, that's basically the name that Martin Fowler put on it. No? Um, so that data mesh architecture. And the idea of data mesh architectures is that we, first of all, we're going to think in terms of product, data products. It's no longer that we, okay, we have this report. The report is just an outcome. It's not a product. That's the reality, okay? So we want to build data products to give value to the company. Also, self-service oriented. That's the idea of data mesh architecture, and that's when roles like the data product owner comes to, into life. So what is DataOps? In the end, this is a, you know, a really long definition for Gartner, but the idea of DataOps, first of all, is to deliver value faster with, as some of uh, already said, with high quality, speed with quality. That's what you want with data. For a long time, data has always been a mess. You know? We would just bring the SQL, we love to use the SQL for our ETLs, and then no one knows how to test that. We want to avoid that. The second reason, of course, is that you want to have usability of, of, your, uh, of your data. You want to bring value of the data, and finally, everything should be sent in dynamic environments. We are not in static environments. This is dynamic environments. Everything, every single day, it's changing, and we have to embrace that change. Just to summarize, what is DataOps? DataOps is just a mix of DevOps, Agile, and Lean. Check, even they have the DataOps manifest. Oh, the same shit as Agile, blah, 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 like our principles. Yeah, if you want to read that stuff, it's good for you. But in, in short, that he wants to be, we want to be Agile, we want to bring quality to our data products. Uh, what are the, basically, uh, with, what do we share, or what DataOps shares with, with DevOps? First of all, automation, CI, CD, so no longer, you know, like, <laughs> I have seen it happen in, in, in our company. There was no dev environment for BI, so literally every single change was you know, production. Um, and, uh, but that's, I know the people is like, ah, oh, that's horrible. Oh, come on, I've seen that everywhere. Like everywhere for, since from Colombia, United States, I've seen that stuff. Like in BI, people, they love doing everything on the production machine with the store procedures. Um, then we have unit test. You know, unit test code coverage becomes extremely important. You want to test. You're playing with the data. You need to guarantee that the data quality of your stuff, it's true. You want to bring the right figures to your business, okay? Environment management, again, you should have development, production. Um, version management, like, as I said, like, okay, where is the, where is the code for these sort of procedures? There. What is there? It's like, there. What the fuck is there? In the server. So if the server dies, the code dies? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can we make a backup of this, please? <laughs> because it's super dangerous and it happens all the time. And finally, monitoring. As I always said, if you have a really good, uh, if you are monitoring properly, if there's a fuck up, you should be the first one to figure out, not your client. You know? If your client comes first to you, you're doing something wrong. Cool. So in travel, a travel star. What is data? So what does it mean for us? So we have a set of values. The first value, do it yourself. 
Second value, it's data democratization. Data should be accessible to everyone. Of course, with certain data governance, it's not like we're going to give data, all, all the data to everyone, but you should be certain data accessible to, to, to everyone. Uh, Data-driven decision-making, super important. And finally, do not repeat yourself. Quality attributes. How do we define quality? And that's really important for me, uh, well, not for me, actually from the Super Engineering Institute, SEI, Carnegie Mellon, quality, it depends about your product, okay? And you define that by a set of non-relational attributes, uh, non-relational, ah, non-functional requirements that are called quality attributes, okay? And quality attributes define the quality of your product. For us, what is? Data quality, availability, usability, reliability, performance, and flexibility. Data needs to be, our data product needs to be, needs to change really fast, they need to have really high performance, we should rely on that data, it should need to be usable, available all the time, and of course, high data quality. And finally, uh, our framework, we're going to have a lot of data lakes, of course, I mean, we still need the data lakes, but we still need the data warehouse, okay? It's not like, I think people they say like, ah, oh, you know, data warehouse, data lake, then, no. That each one, for every single scenario, is going to do the job, okay? We're going to have data pipelines, a data catalog, and a data dictionary for the business to understand, okay, what does it mean, okay? And the data catalog will tell us where that stuff resides. So this is the fun part, okay? The architecture. Our reference model is based on a really popular reference architecture that is called, well, two reference architecture, that's in the Kappa architecture and the Lambda architecture. Uh, for those who doesn't know, like Lambda mostly are based in three different uh, layers. That is what you call the speed layer, the serving layer, and uh, uh, the batch layer. So the speed layer is everything that is going to provide in real time, and that's mostly Kappa. When you just use Kappa, you just have a speed layer and serving layer. But we want to have sometimes aggregations, and those aggregations are going to happen in, during the batch layer. Finally, we mix everything using event-driven architectures, and those events uh, is, they are based on publisher subscriber architectural pattern. This is our reference architecture. So our reference architecture looks something like that. We divide it in five different tiers, and we have one base tier that is the one that is going to monitor and automate all the whole process. So the first tier that is called the source tier is the one that is in charge of all the internal and external services that are going to publish data to our pipelines in a certain way, or are going to produce the events. What is an event? So when you're moving to event-driven architecture, the first thing is to ask yourself, what is an event? So in general, the definition of event, and it, this is a really good definition, it's from uh, domain-driven design, is you know, it's an occurrence, something that happens in a specific period of time, a state of an entity. That's basically an event. In business intelligence, there are three different, con there, there's a concept called a slow change in dimension, and it's how do you want to record changes in your database. The type one is the most popular one. People update the data. What is the problem of updating the data of your database? You lose the history, okay? However, why, what happens if you just add type three? The type three means like, okay, I'm just going to add the changes. Well, now you need to, aggregate all the different changes, and sometimes you need to consolidate that transaction. So type one and type three were designed for one reason, because storage was really expensive. So type two, it was like, oh, how are you going to duplicate the data? That costs too much, you know, one gig is expensive. Well, no longer, that's no longer true. So right now it's much better just to duplicate the data it's at state multiple times. It, does, it changed one number, I don't care. We're under a commodity servers, and storage is no longer the problem. Performance, quality is my problem. This is a really good standard. It's called Cloud Events. If you guys are moving to event-driven architectures, uh, it's a standard that you guys definitely need to see. It defines what are the, yeah, the, the schemas that you need to use, okay? Um, I'm just giving you some examples of like the must have in the case of, of cloud events, and these are some examples of the nice to have for cloud events. Event granularity. So there's a problem. How big my event should be? 
And how do you define that? If you go in extreme mode, it's like you most, mostly you're going to send your database. Okay, here you go, my database. It sounds fun, but I have seen it. Okay? That literally, I, I saw it once. Like the person drops the whole database and recreated the game every single day. And you're like, what the fuck is happening here? Uh, and, uh, but it happens, you know, because it, they don't know how to manage events, and it happens. And then you can go into a really fine grain, you know, that when you have like fields or sort of properties. But what you actually want is a domain event. A domain event is, is defined by the boundaries of the domain itself. So just to give you an example, we have a search. There are at least two events in the case of Travel Star, a search request and a search response. But the domain event itself is the search. So you consolidate or you aggregate both events into one, and that consolidates the search record. Actually, in the case of Travel Star, we receive multiple requests, sorry, multiple price itineraries for our suppliers, but we're not presenting to you that, guys, because we filter those itineraries. Those filtrations we also consider as a different event that we consolidate in the search record. That's why sometimes one search can, uh, maybe the size could be 100 megabytes in our site. And that's why we persist them. Just one search. As I, I'm saying um, below, if the aggregation, sorry, if the event is really small, you need more aggregation to, of course, produce these massive events or domain events. How do you transfer those events? So there are two ways. You can say plain, or you can send binaries all over the wire. This is, those are the standards, JSON, XML. And Please, if you send something plain, try to compress it. Uh, and if you send something binary, you can also compress it or use codecs to reduce the size. In our case at Travel Start, we decided to go with JSON and compression with GZIP. I tried Avro, believe me, I tried. Uh, and it creates so much problems, especially when you have a lot of nested structures. So our, you know, we have a standard, it's called OTA, and it's a really, really nested structure. And when you try to send that over the wire and try to process that using Avro, everything is a mess. So in the end, we decided, okay, let's try just JSON, Minify, with GZIP, and the, it was a 96% of size reduction. When I tried with Avro, it was 98. So we said, fuck it, let's just send it. Um, the aggregation tier. So as I said, there's a probability that you have atomic events, and you need to send those atomic events all over the wire and you need to make the aggregation of those events. That's the aggregation tier. So we want to convert the atomic events into domain events. This aggregation can happen in multiple parts. First, inside the source. You can make the aggregation in the source. You can make the aggregation outside the source, meaning could be in a different uh, service. I think our first presentation, they showed something like that. They have a different service to make the aggregation. Or we can do it in an ingestion pipeline, okay? Um, we have external data sources that sometimes we want, we want uh, an external uh, source to access to our data or to send data. We should expose endpoints, and in the way that we're doing right now at TravelStar, we're using our serverless functions on stateless containers. And schedules can serve as trigger to start an ETL if it's necessary. So this is just an example of the areas of aggregation. You can do it, as I said, here uh, on the source. Please, if you're doing the source, try to do it or on memory or use read replicas to avoid problems with the transactional database. Um, the aggregation system could be a, someone in the middle. And if you want to go really rude, you can do it on the JSON pipeline. But I'm going to guarantee you you're going to have really bad times if you try to do it. Uh, well, it's going to be much more complex. Like, you need to think now in time, in windowing, session windowing, especially when we work with the stream pipelines, order will matter, and that's a little bit messy, to be honest. So my recommendation, well, it depends. You can use whatever you want, but if as much of the source system, you reduce the complexity. Um, if you want to expose endpoints, right now, as I said, where you're seeing uh, cloud functions, they work extremely well, super easy to develop, uh, but also I have used Lambda in the past, People who have used Lambda, it's really cool. The problem is that sometimes you need to use a framework like serverless or something like that. Or, or you can use containers to expose endpoints uh, to your suppliers or people who want to access the data. Um, schedulers, in the case of, of, 
of Google, we have Cloud Scheduler. You can use Amazon CloudWatch in the case of AWS. And that was all. Cool. The distribution tier. The distribution tier is where all the topics, queues, are going to start distributing the data to the different subscribers. What does that mean? So in our distribution tier, what you're going to have is the queues that are going to receive or raw or clean data and distribute it to the pipelines or subscribers that are going to read that data. Recommendation, topic per event, okay? They cost nothing, by the way. Like you can have um, as much topics as you want. The cost is based on the input data, okay? So do not like, ah, oh, let's uh, try to reduce cost. Like, whoa, what happened? Um, let's try to reduce cost. No. Topic per event, much better than start trying to identify different events per topic. Subscription per subscriber, same concept. Uh, and also, it doesn't have a cost, so go for it. And the communication between the producer and topics could fail. Uh, just keep it that mind in mind. So there are two ways. First thing, you retry. Hey, I tried to polish. I couldn't. Let's try another time. Okay. If it fails a lot of times, maybe the service is just down. So you have to create the dead letters. That's what we call a graveyard. So the dead letter is going to persist what was the event, the payload, and why it failed. So we can always recover those, um, those dead letters if it's needed. The idea is that you will never lose data. That's the principle. And this is an example of travel star. Those are all the topics that we have. Um, I'm just going to choose one of those topics. Let's go to the booking topic. So now I can see the booking topic. I can see how I'm receiving all these bookings. That's everything, of course, is real time. And I can see the subscription. So I have two different kinds of subscriptions. I have, let me see if this shit works. OK. So this is the raw subscription, and I have the clean subscription. OK? So I have different kinds of subscriptions attached to this kind of, of, um, of topic. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm talking cock. Uh, no, that's, <laughs> there are two different subscriptions, because there are, like, one, is, one was designed, uh, sorry, there was one for development, and there was one for production we want to receive from, from development. Yeah, I know. What the fuck, man? Um, the transformation tier. The transformation tier is maybe the most important one. Uh, in this tier, we're going to actually clean and reach our data. And those are going to be our stream pipelines. So we can be stream, can be stream or batch. This architecture is mostly based on stream pipelines. But again, it can be batch. Yes, for sure. No worries. The idea is to have pipelines um, that they receive the domain events, they process it, and they persist it eventually. A pipeline can be split in by domain. I mean, you can have pipeline per domain, like one pipeline for booking, another pipeline for search, or by resource consumption. Why? Because there's some pipelines, they're too small, that then you're going to start expending too much time and resource in something that is, just happens once in a while. So you can start you know, aggregating those pipelines. Always preserving the first rules, that you receive events per topic and all that kind of stuff. Three different categories. Ingestion, integration, and quality. I'm going to explain what is the meaning of each one of those. The quality one is really important to keep in mind that is we want to preserve what is called data lineage and data provenance. How the data is changing and where the data came from. And that's what it does mean. Also, and this is a warning because data can, can bite, um, serverless functions can be used, but be careful with them because if you start creating too much functions for your pipeline, eventually orchestrate them is always going to be a mess. So that's quite of the good things about using frameworks like Apache Beam, that you're got, you have an agnostic framework that is going to create an, a graph of that stuff, and you can control the whole flow. So what happens with, the, with, the frame, with these kind of frameworks that also I think Spark, I remember Spark used to do that stuff, that stuff too, you create a directed execute graph. So in the case of the ingestion pipeline, you basically have, first of all, you create the data lakes, you process the data, you enrich, you clean. In case we have a different like, step, that is the quality check, so we, you add quality, quality scenarios to this stuff. And finally, you can polish the clean data in a clean topic, or you can persist the data in something like BigQuery. That's what is happening to us right now. And even create backups in real time. That's what we're doing also. Um, as I always mentioned, one of the problems when you have ETLs 
people love SQL. And they have a huge store procedures with SQL that no one understands, with 400 joins. Um, so what we did at Trollstar, we created a framework. And that framework is based on, it's basically it's an ORM, but it's an ORM for BigQuery. We called it OBQM. And the idea of this framework is that you're just defining annotations. You can create the whole table structure, the schematization, the versioning of all the tables. And literally, you just create a pollo, and you just send that pollo. You have a instantiate that object, and it's going to create everything for you. OK? So we want to avoid all these transformations, all this manual stuff that you do in your pipelines, all this code, and make it in a framework. Right now, just because of that, one pipeline can take between three hours and one day to be done with 100% of test coverage. So it's quite good. Oh, almost 100%. You know, that's never trust in that stuff. It's cool. Um, quality check. So each record has a dimension that is called the quality check dimension. The idea is that each record is analyzed and is going to persist how was the state of the quality of that record. So we can identify quality issues of our data. So as you can see here, just to give you an example, this is a record that everything is normal, but this is a record that has unexpected values and is telling us why has unexpected, what was the value that he was expecting and what was the value that he received. So based on that, we can start analyzing our data and even create reports on real time of the quality of our data and take actions over that. Another dimension that we always add to every single record is metadata. Understand basically the data provenance of our solution. So where is the data coming from? How it came, you know, like it came from this, from this instance, uh, instance ID, whatever, and it had compression, it was adjacent, we can understand how the data was processed originally. The integration pipelines are just most of the time batch pipelines. They're just going to consolidate different data sources. Okay, they could be in BigQuery, could be in, in data lakes, and eventually they're going to join these sources to consolidate data marts that the business can analyze eventually. And finally, the quality pipelines are just pipelines dedicated to analyze the quality of our data. Something really interesting about these quality pipelines is that this, those are the ones in charge of bringing the dead letters, or dead, the, the, the events, from bring back to life. That's why we call those pipelines the necromancers. So they will bring everyone like, who died. Again, I'm going to send those events back again. Uh, if you can send them, okay? Because if there was a data quality issue and that was the reason why I created that later, well, we need to analyze that. Cool. So this is an example of our quality pipelines. They can create this kind of reports. You can see that everything looks quite normal except the error reserve financial summary has 10 values inconsistent. You can go dig a little bit and you can see that he was expecting certain values to have this specific value. For instance, he was expecting 1,000, but he received 1,299. Then you can, and here I can identify even what was the, the record that was failing. It was really easy for me to just literally do this like in three minutes with Data Studio. So I just, okay, I just dropped the data source that was my table, and I start analyzing all the quality issues that I have on my database. Not all the reports, they need to be, they need to look beautiful. They can also look like this. But it can tell me, you know, this, this report is telling me right now where was the exception, you know, this booking UID wasn't there, and the amount of records that it failed, and the specific part of the code where it failed. So we can always keep trace of what's going on in our product. Complete visibility. This is an example of one of the pipelines. This is the search pipeline. Um, you, can you can see that each step it has a different purpose. Uh, in data flow, with data flow, that is the product that, sorry, that we're using. Um, data flow, basically, you can auto-scale. So we auto-scale in our stream pipelines. Uh, in the case of the search, we have a, hundred, a cluster of 100 servers, and it auto scales uh, depending on the demand of our searches. Uh, but as always, as I also said, you can have a pipeline that consolidates small pipelines. And uh, yeah, this, this is an example of that. If I just click that pipeline, it becomes something like this. And this is part of the framework. Just, we just recreate all this stuff, and it's something that's going to create automatically just by a JSON configuration that we, we, we're doing. Woo. 
feel awake or not? Ah, oh, come on. OK. Um, the last year, so no worries, guys. It's almost there, almost there. Uh, it's, called the ser it's called the serving tier. The serving tier, I divided in three different parts. The first part, uh, of course, it's just where we're going to start all the raw and raw clean data. The first part are the raw, the raw data. So we have all the data lakes, date letters, and backups. Okay, that's the raw data. We're persisting all this stuff in GCS, in the case of Google. The OLAP, online analytical processing. Basically, we have data marks, we have ubiquitous data. Okay, that's basically event sourcing or data sourcing that we're doing, and the real-time views. And finally, in terms of analytics, we are moving to whatever it makes you happy. You know? Like right now, Tableau is still like the product that we keep using, but we have seen a lot of potential in Data Studio. And for instance, our CFO, he loves Power BI, and he just connects to the data source, and he does whatever he wants in Power BI. If he feels comfortable with Power BI, who am I to say to not do it? You know? And if you can even use spreadsheets, you can connect your spreadsheet to, to BigQuery and do those beautiful pivot tables that everyone loves to do. So it's fine. Um, in terms of persisting those dead letters or dead, uh, data lakes, well, again, you can persist all this stuff using plain text or binary. Mm, right now, we're persisting in JSON, JSON plus uh, GZIP. But definitely, we want to move to ORC. Uh, if we move to ORC, right now, the compression rate that we have is 80%, um, a little bit more. But with ORC, it could become 98%. So, in that case, there's a huge difference that, of course, it will impact your cost. This is an example of our, debt of our data lakes, for instance. Really simple, it's just a structure of folder structure. For every single event, we define the dead letters, the raw data that we receive every single day. How can you keep your cost aligned? And you're not going, you, because you have big data, and then you become a little bit obsessive and start persisting everything. Um, well, we try to move or to reduce the cost by using what Google call, uh, calls the near line, call line, and archive life cycles. So every single, in our case, every single 180 days and every single year, we move our data to a different kind of a storage type. So the storage type of near line, what it's going to do is that the, the cost will be reduced in a 43%. Uh, what is the catch? The catch is that performance can be reduced in terms of querying the data. And if you don't, if you delete data before the minimum duration, it's going to cost quite a lot. So it, it's a catch. You know? But it will reduce the cost of your storage if you move to archive even to 89%. So that's quite important. Data X versus data warehouses. Again, there's no versus. A data lake is raw data, it's dirty, but it's really cool to understand the picture as a whole. However, it's not a structure for analytical purposes. Data warehouse, on the other side, even when it's good at data, is defined or it has a quality process and use structure in a way for, to make people analyze your data. So data marts are basically just an orientation or are hypercubes that we define in a multi-dimensional uh, schema design. So we have multiple dimensions, and all each dimension represents descriptions of your data, how you want to analyze it, and you have facts that they define what happened in a specific moment of time, a specific event. When you do this kind of denormalization in our transactional database, like, like I don't know, Microsoft SQL, whatever, usually ended up in a snowflake fashion. Right now, when with BigQuery in our case, it's a column database and it's a documented database, we can nest those fields and we can have really ubiquity data where, just to give you an example, search table for us has 300 columns and the booking table has 900 columns. So that's an example that's our search table has more than 300 columns. The table size is 112 terabytes uh, and it just, it just precedes the last three months actually. But a query there could take, to, I don't know, 1.5 seconds to 10 seconds. Okay, so it's extremely, extremely aggressive BigQuery. But you need to present somehow a much better way 
to your customers. So you can present unmaterialized views, that's why the reason of degradation pipelines, or regular views where you can present just enough data that the customers, your customers, that is your, uh, uh, your colleagues, are going to use to analyze the data. Uh, this is just to give an example how are we uh, versioning everything we have in our system. And finally, the automation tier. So in our case, the automation tier, we try to monitor as much as we can. Of course, the first thing that we, we want to monitor, of course, are the topics, pipelines, performance. And of course, this automation tier also have everything with CI and CD. This is just an example of how we monitor the box. That's called um, Bug Tracer, in the case of, I think that name, um, in Google. So you can choose a bug. You can see how often it's happening. And you can even connect directly to your code. So, hey, it failed. He sent you to the specific part of the code that failed. We have dashboards in Stack Driver, so we can monitor the CPU, uh, topics, subscriptions. This is basically what is called a Stack Driver Profiler, so I can identify bottlenecks in our pipelines, in our code, the performance. And alerting, basically, you want to create alerts based on if the messages have been delivered, if messages are, uh, messages are in queue, if you have too many resources, and if their error rate is too high. Those are all the alert policies that we have so far. Well, not all, but whatever it was capable to put in that slide. This is just an example of, for instance, uh, the search stream not events coming. So if I stop receiving searches, that means, hey, something's happening. Uh, maybe we should take care of that. And those are the messages that I received. So I received an email, a Slack, an SMS. Not panic at all. And lastly, we have CI/CD. We use everything with Jenkins. We use our queue for the uh, quality of the code. And uh, we probably were going to move to Cloud Build. Mm, we don't love so much Jenkins, to be honest. Uh, and the uh, infrastructure as code, we're using Cloud Deployment Manager. If you guys have ever used Terraform, you're gonna, lo you're gonna love Cloud Deployment Manager completely. This is Jenkins pipelines, our pipelines that we have a Jenkins, uh, simple pipelines that we do to deploy, to validate everything. Something really cool, we use something called Spotless so we can validate like the structure of your code, it's, you know, like the standards are cool. Then we do pull request analysis and code analysis and that's when you can see that on our PRs, there's a sonar bot that comments on your code and tells you how to fix it, your shit. So it tells you like, hey dude, what the fuck are you doing here? Like, <laughs> try to fix it, uh, that's actually interesting, and also it helps you with the code cover. So just to give you an example, in this, ex in this case, he tells you that the 81%, it was 81.6% and you reduce it to 80.8% and he's blocking the PR in that specific scenario. That's something we applied in all our products at Trial Start. Those are examples of the YAML schema. It's a really simple YAML schema that you do in in, in code deploy, in deployment manager, sorry. You can even define patterns, so if I don't respect that pattern, he's going to fail the, the deployment. And then this is like just a Jinja template, everything is based on Python. You can see, for instance, this is an example where I define in the life cycles of the Google storage. And in the end, that's the code. So when you define your templates, then, okay, I want to create a bucket. Here you go. As simple as that. And you can see when it deploys, how it deploys, what it's going to deploy, everything resides on GCP. And that was all. Thank you so much. Okay. Any questions? In the middle at the back there. Oh, hello. Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. Quick question, could you maybe go into some detail about how you deal with JSON schemas and maybe schema evolution? You mentioned data provenance. The, okay, more. that's a really good question. So something we try to do in terms of the JSON schema, so we have in our backend, we use a standard called OTA. 
and that standard, well, it's, it's basically, it's, uh, those are X, XSD files and that are versioned in our repository. So whenever this, something that we define as a rule is that you're never going to change something, you're just going to add, you're never going to delete. So the good things about our pipelines is they're never going to break because we don't analyze a specific schema, they're agnostic of the schema. They just go and follow a specific uh, node of three path in a certain way. So if the three path doesn't exist, what is going to happen is probably it's going to generate a null and at some moment during the pipeline it's going to fail and the quality check is going to generate alerts. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? No. Okay, cool. cool. Let's thank, thank you. Her.